I will call the meeting to order. Please join me in the pledge. And I will the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have the consent agenda and our packets. You had a chance to review. I'll make a motion. I'll second. That's wrong, huh? Yes. All right. Motion by Shea, second by Jorgensen to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Okay. Aye. Right. Opposed? Motion has carried. Right, we can move into the public hearing to dispose of title or interest in real estate to convey Highway 92 new access rights to the Iowa DOT at 40790 Highway 92 Carson, Iowa for the Highway 59 bridge replacement for project NSHN-059-3 parent 48 2R-78. John Rasmussen. Oh, uh, sure. So this is a DOT project. Well, let's make a motion, motion to open public hearing. I'll we'll second that. Right. I'm not the only one that does that. I know. <laughs> Melvin, will you call? Do we need a roll call on that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Chairman Miller. Aye. Supervisors Bell. Aye. Shea. Aye. Jorgensen. Aye. Okay. All right. So this is a DOT project to replace the Highway 59 bridge. The is over Highway 92. So it's a, a little bridge that's been struck a couple of times. They're going to reconstruct the bridge and race it up. Um, part of that project they wanted from us is these agreements. And all these agreements basically say is we're not going to ask for a driveway within 300 feet of the new bridge. Uh, it doesn't change any property lines for us. It doesn't change our existing drives on 59 or 92. It's just uh, us agreeing that we give up our rights to ask for a driveway. So pretty, pretty simple on our part. Probably the bigger question is the construction of, of that bridge is going to be a pretty good impact on the county. We won't have a detour in the county. We tried to take them through Macedonia. We couldn't, our bridge wasn't adequate for that traffic. Uh, not really a detour through Carson. So I think the problem for us will probably be the informal detours that develop as the work goes on. How long there. of a detour are they going to have? I'm, I'm not sure where they're going to take them. Actually, they'll try to keep them on another state route, so they'll probably go over to 71. You know, it'll be one of those detours that's not really a detour, other than on paper, I guess. So we'll work that out as the time comes. But um, they'll only have that sporadically, won't they? Will it be a very long detour? Uh, it'll probably be a, a nine-month sort of thing. Oh, so they're going to replace that bridge and. Okay. I was kind of hoping they could take it down the ramps and back up, but I think since they're raising the bridge, those ramps are going to be impacted too. So, okay. why don't they just lower the road? <laughs> lower 93. There you go. They didn't ask Melvin. No. There's your next calling. Yeah. We don't want to mess with that. Yeah. We have 92 and 59 closed. And for... I think 92 will remain open. There'll probably be some overnight closures or something when they're working overhead, but 92 should remain open. John, Again, not my just, project. I'm just uh, trying to help them wrap the right of way part of it up. I'm just curious. Uh, 136 uh, high right, that, that facilitates for uh, the tractor trailer, right? What what hit what hits the bridge? Uh, you, I think there's oversized loads that are they're not overweight. They're just oversized. So last time it was a guy pulling tobacco and he forgot to put the arm of tobacco down. Yeah. Yeah. Really it was left up and whacked it. It was closed for about a minute. Summer, I think. There's, there's always something sneaking through. The problem we face now is if there's a big load, they will uh, get on 59, then go to six, then they'll come down through trainer. So getting that bridge replaced will help me get a lot of big loads off the north entrance to trainer pretty much on, on that county road. So it does help us in the long term because there's problems on six and 92 as far as clearance. Uh, on highway six, we have that railroad bridge there just, just outside of town. So following the public hearing, uh, there's three items on your agenda, and that's pretty much the documents the DOT needs to to move forward. And again, all they do really do is just give our right to ask for another driveway, which if you're out there, there's a big hill. We're not going to ask for a driveway there. 
You're going to get a lot more traffic on the shortcut, probably. Well, you're going to be more traffic through Macedonian and through Carson. Yeah. People just make their own detours. Oh. Um, they can't do just one side of the bridge at a time. No, I think the elevation difference is too much. And it, it's costing us nothing, correct? No. No, it's not our projects. It's, it's theirs. So there's no speak on it? Yeah. Is there anyone from the public who wants to speak on the public hearing for the Highway 92 or the Highway 95 bridge? Is there anybody on the phone or on Zoom? Teams? Teams, there we go. Motion to close public hearing. Second. Melvin, we call the roll, please. Chairman Miller. Aye. Supervisors Jorgensen. Aye. Shea. Aye. Aye. Public hearing is closed. Next, we will have discussion and our decision to approve and sign resolution 50 2024 for the sale of real property and delivery of conveyance to the we Iowa DOT. We need to do the uh, motion after the public hearing on the rates. I think that's what we're doing, isn't it? Well, I thought you went down to item B. Not following my script very well in my. Well, look on the thing. <clears throat> See that yeah. right there. Above we, just, that. We, we just got to. We just got to move on. What I'll we make that got. motion to dispose of title or interest in real estate to convey Highway 92 new access rights to the DOT at 40970 Highway 92 Carson, Iowa, for Highway 59 bridge replacement for Project NHS. Uh, dash zero five nine dash three parent forty eight dash two r dash seven eight how's that thanks Scott. second that work yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right chairman miller aye supervisor jorgensen aye bill aye aye motion carried all right i think resolution fifty twenty twenty four does the same thing doesn't it the difference. So all three of those were the DOT's documents. Make a motion to approve all three. Do one at a time. Okay. Time. Okay. You want me to make that motion uh, to approve and authorize the board to sign board res resolution 50 24 for the sale of real property and deliver of conveyance to the Iowa Department of Transportation for Project NHSN 059-3, parent 48-2R-78. I think it's been right by the next one. I don't know. <laughs> and I'll second that. Uh... All right, we have a motion by Belt, a second by Shea to approve resolution 50-2024. Melvin, please call the roll. Chairman Miller. Aye. Supervisor Belt. Aye. Uh, Whitman is absent. Uh, Shea. Jorgensen. Aye. Aye. Motion is carried. All right, moving to the next no one. Resolution. Ruben authorized the chairperson to sign the access rights deeds with the Iowa DOT for the same project. <laughs> so moved. Second. <laughs> we got a motion and a second. Additional discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next one, approve and authorize the chairperson to sign the access control agreement with the Iowa DOT for project NHSN-059-348. So moved. Second. Additional discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. All right, next we've got John Rasmussen, engineer. Um, set the bid opening for September 3rd, 2024 at 10 a.m. at the Board of Supervisor hearing for bridge materials. I have a bridge on Elm Tree Road over Silver Creek that 
the rating dropped recently to three tons. Uh, we, do, we don't even like doing three tons, I guess. We like to do seven, seven's a school bus. So um, it's a truss bridge, that's one of our struggles because they become multi-span on local roads. So we don't get, state and federal funding is not coming quick enough to get to those. So we try to do it with local funds, but they're also multi-span, which is larger than we typically tackle. So um, Brandon and my office put together a design for a multi-span steel bridge with a wood laminate deck. So it's a little different than what we've done before, but it's kind of kind of fun to have uh, different people from different places with different ideas. So we're gonna bid one of those and see how well it works for our trust replacements placement and we may come back and with the modified plans or material list and try this some more but uh, we do need to deal with this bridge as quickly as we can though so what what kind of weight rating will that be it'll be a legal bridge so it'll be a, a 9600 or 96,000 okay. pound is that that one that's rusted uh no this is a truss bridge and it kind of fell off the the rockers and the caps rotten so we'd have to jack up the bridge to fix it. it. It is cost more than the bridge is worth to even try to fix it. And even then we still would be limited on capacity. So it, it is needs Where was the bridge at again? It's on Elm Tree Road. So oh, okay. uh, just east of L66. Okay, thank you. We have, we have a pair of them out there, not too far from each other, but we have been kind of struggling for years trying to figure out how we're gonna deal with them. But I think we have a plan moving forward. So we're eager to try one out. Brandon came up with this. Yeah, it's good. Nice. What school what school district is it in? Uh, that's Riverside. Make a motion to uh, set time and date for Hot County Secondary Roads HM25 bridge material for September 3rd, 2024 at 10 a.m. Second. Second. We have a motion by Belt and a second by Shea. additional discussion all those in favor all right opposed motion is carried great thank you thank you john next up doug reed ema discussion and or decision to approve and sign resolution 51-2024 entitled a resolution to approve and adopt the potawatomi county hazard mitigation plan morning doug good morning everybody uh, yeah, this is uh, the process we go through every uh, five years to have a FEMA certified uh, mitigation plan, which is a requirement under certain preparedness or mitigation grants for the county to have access to. Um, we were in that process of uh, reviewing and editing this uh, uh, in February and March with uh, FEMA, and then, uh, and then we got a little sidetracked with some things uh, in the spring and, and so far this summer. So. We got that done, FEMA signed off on it. Uh, so jurisdictions that formally adopt the plan by resolution <clears throat> will have access, uh, continuing access to the uh, to mitigation grants and things like that, which will be important uh, here timely because we know mitigation grant funds come available at the tail end of disasters and that funding is awarded statewide they're competitive grants and they're based on a percentage off of the, the total uh, disaster cost and losses that, that FEMA calculates for those incidents. So we'll have uh, at least three uh, federal declarations that will all come with mitigation dollars attached on the backside that uh, um, our uh, municipal governments, schools, things like that can uh, take a look at uh, to mitigate future impacts and losses. Doug, will this go for individual homes too? No, this is, this is for uh, governmental stuff. Well, <laughs> I'll take that back because technically, like uh, uh, like you're aware of, uh, flood acquisition uh, projects and things like that fall under this grant program. So there is some uh, to that degree anyway, but primarily it's like, uh, you know, schools or, or like our campgrounds may be constructing and putting in uh, uh, storm shelter safe room type of things uh, we've done that before um, generators for critical facilities obviously uh, flood acquisition for properties those kind of things um, it just kind of depends on what the state mitigation priorities are and, and how they score the applications based on those priorities but there will be some opportunities so we want to make sure that uh, 
we've got everybody on board and up to the uh, current plan. So all the communities in the county and would it include townships too then? No, not townships. Just communities. Yep. And school and school district. Yep. Yep. It can be it can be municipal and county government and designated uh, special districts. Okay. So school schools, things like that. We got people stepping forward for this. I'm sorry, what do you mean? Different different communities are they stepping forward at this time asking about this oh we, we've got some uh some folks that are uh, working on a grant application right now i think uh i, I was thinking I, I i don't have uh my latest list in front of me i think tri center schools is looking at a possible uh, uh severe storm safe room project um, I, and, and we've got some lingering applications that have been sitting in queue for up to several years just because there's been no mitigation money. So I know, you know, previously we've submitted a notice of interest to try and put storm shelters in our county campgrounds and things like that. So, um, but without being in the latest version of the required five year updated plan. Once your application goes in, it's going to be. Don't collect two hundred dollars or pass go until that happens. I know we've got the city of Evoke has already approved uh, their resolution and sent it in, but but I know we've got some communities looking at stuff, and there'll be there'll be reason for everybody after this year to take a look at potential projects uh, that they've identified in the plan. That is, as I was reviewing the plan, it reminded me how much we rely on our first responders. Mm -hmm. And it again, it reemphasized the fact that we need to put some focus on getting the pager system fixed within the community. And I know that's not directly on your shoulders, but we need to work and proceed with getting those yep. fixed. Yep. And when it comes to a lot of these grant programs that fall under this, this deal, there's there's always a nice tap dance and a fine line between what they consider mitigation and response type of project. So, uh, but we can continue to look at it, uh, at those things as well. So is the warning signals or sirens, are they considered response or? Uh, the mitigation grants have been used uh, uh, to, to do uh, outdoor warning sirens uh, previously. Uh, in in other jurisdictions, uh, we we haven't here, but but it's been done in some other communities, and and this also ties into some other uh, grant programs like the BRIC program and things like that, are kind of the same thing, but but resilience and and uh, you know capacity building type of projects. Thank you. So this is all involves just amending or updating the current plan. Plan is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, in Reader's Digest version, yep, that's that's what it is. I'll, I'll make that motion. I'll second. Thanks, Doug. Yep. We have a motion by Bell and a second by Jorgensen to approve and authorize the board to sign resolution 51-2024 to adopt the Pottawatomie County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Melvin, we call the roll, please. Henry Miller. Aye. Supervisors Bell. Aye. Jay. Aye. Jorgensen. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, just to uh, let you know, we've got we'll be out uh, at the uh, national night out with uh, a lot of our public safety partners this evening here in Council Bluffs. Uh, but we're also going to be joined by some folks from uh, state and from FEMA uh, to take the opportunity of having 800 some people typically at this event to do some outreach. Uh, we'll also be uh, at, at your uh, uh, town hall meeting in Oakland on the 14th, and we're bringing a short team out there as well. And uh, we've, we've arranged to uh, have the council chambers uh, as kind of a little side room for that. So if somebody needs to get registered, check their status, we don't have to worry about personal information being overseen or stuff like that. So are you setting up over here on Main Street? Yeah, I'm sorry. Where are you setting up at tonight? Oh, it's down at uh, uh, Rivers Edge Park. 
over region okay okay is is where they're at so uh, be all kinds of stuff there yeah and and we're also in the middle of of planning an outreach event uh for here sometime in the next couple of weeks out in Minden to kind of target uh, our initial disaster victims from that area, the Crescent area and things like that as well. So a lot of moving parts and a, a recovery meeting uh, tomorrow at the EOC about 930, I believe it is. Is it August 21st, the last day to sign up for help from FEMA? It's 22nd or 23rd on that. There was some discussion about maybe an extension, but nothing official so we're going with with what it is so that's kind of why we're taking advantage of some of these uh, community events and town hall meetings to do some last push outreach before it's too late because our percentage is very high with turnout on those from residents you, you know it 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 comes and goes um <laughs> there's higher percentage in some areas but you know at the end of the day you know, I think uh, when myself and, and Craig from External Affairs was looking at some stuff and some data the other day, just kind of anecdotally trying to do math in our head, I think I think we were really kind of somewhere close to that 40% of potential impacted folks uh, signing up for some form of assistance doesn't mean it's it's all FEMA or anything like that. Okay. So that's actually pretty good. I mean, we'd always like to see it be if you are just sign up and see kind of a deal but you find a lot of things to get people you know to do that um timing red tape you know the existing stress and things like that and and so it's it's always difficult but you know, well, we've got a big push coming back out right now yesterday you probably saw we had a, a big press release and some information go out on a, a housing program for those impacted by the disaster right up to Fifty thousand dollars in gap funding, um, but but again, they they have to already be registered with FEMA to take advantage of that state program. So, so that's kind of why we're we're really trying to make a big push right now. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Then you've got FEMA set up at the Veterans yes, Services yep. Building. Set up yesterday, open to the public at uh, about one o'clock. So they'll be there through at least August. I know they want to be. Running that operation later into September, we got some scheduling things to kind of figure out uh, with that facility. So we we'll either move or we'll get those worked out. They just don't like to pack up and leave, and you know have to go back. So it's just uh, a matter of what's most efficient. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, Carlos Morales, Transportation and Data Manager, MAPA, and Mia Hashenberger, Transportation Planner at MAPA. Good morning, Carlos. Good morning. Good morning. While the presentation comes up, thank you very much for having us. Yeah. It's exciting. I think this is actually my first time uh, presenting to the commission. Just come over here. Just right in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> there uh, you go. I want to send you John. <laughs> so thank you very much for having us. Uh, I'm with MAPA, the Metropolitan Area Planning Agency. Chairperson uh, Miller, thank you for all your service on RPA and uh, Commissioner Belt for the work at our board meetings. But today is going to be about long range planning and what we have to do. I'll give a little background on what MAPA is and Mia's going to take over after that to talk about our long range transportation plan. Next slide, please. So that's our agenda. Next slide. We'll go through that real quick. So what is MAPA? For those of you that don't know, we're, we function with many different hats and many different geographies. MAPA is a regional um, council of governments representing uh, most of the counties you see there, plus some. Uh, we also serve as a regional planning agency. Uh, our primary duty is as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the dark green shaded area that consists of Douglas County, Sarpy County, and the urbanized area of Pottawatomie County. So what does that mean? We're a regional planning agency that uh, our primary function is to help local communities in their long range planning coordinate big regional projects. Uh, this includes safety. These include uh, looking at 
traditional bridges that link different communities, cities, and regions together. Um, that's mainly what we do. We also uh, are have a lot of federal requirements that we keep up on. Um, and one of them is going to be our long range transportation plan, which we have to talk about. And the big thing that we're here to talk also about is this regional planning affili affiliation. On the Iowa side of things, uh, smaller rural um, counties have been uh, joined together in this regional planning affiliation, uh, which for Iowa, for this region, Region 18, includes Harrison, Shelby, Potawatomi, and Mills. Uh, so those counties have come together, and we, MAPA, serve as their uh, kind of administrative arm uh, to run federal projects, run through uh, federal funding, uh, mainly for transportation purposes. Uh, so that's kind of MAPA in a nutshell. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll let Mia take it away. Yeah, so uh, we're currently working on our updating our long range transportation plan. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so we'll kind of go over what it is and review the previous iteration and what we're working on for the renewal of it. Next slide, please. So long range transportation plan is a requirement for metropolitan planning organizations. So as Carlos mentioned, we deal with um, the urban area of Douglas and Sarpy counties in Nebraska and the urbanized portion of Pottawatomie County in Iowa. For the regional planning affiliation, which covers the more rural, the four counties, um, it's a requirement by the Iowa DOT and it has to be updated every five years. And so our next update is due next fall. And it covers um, a planning horizon of 25 years. So it, it covers up until 2050, basically. And the reason the long range transportation plan is so important is because um, it kind of outlines what the current needs are in a region, uh, what what needs to be done in the future, where funding should go. And we do all this by looking at things like um, demographic patterns, transportation patterns, uh, land growth patterns. We analyze safety data. And probably most importantly, we gather public input. So input from the public and from stakeholders like you, and that helps us kind of refine and prioritize um, goals. Next slide, please. So the previous um, LRTP uh, had these goals, uh, basically uh, preservation, which means maintaining the current transportation system, uh, investing in increasing safety, investing in uh, planning transportation facilities that facilitate economic development, um, looking at different modes of tran transportation, such as um, cycling, transit, things like that to protect the environment, looking at different, providing different transportation options for residents in the area, and then also looking at how uh, communities grow and how land is used and um, supporting designing a transportation system that supports that the growth that's going on. So that was those were the goals for last time. Next slide, please. Um, and in the in developing the last iteration, um, some of the major findings were that uh, there's increased farming activity in the region and um, farm parcels tend to be are becoming more and more scattered. And so that uh, can place a burden on the secondary road system and result in the need for more maintenance and more long-term maintenance. Uh, also, it was found that people travel further to go to work. Um, work locations are more dispersed. And then in the more urban areas, um, there was a trend towards increased population. In more rural areas, there was a trend towards decreased population. Overall, the population was found to be aging in the region. And even though there are, there are variations, variability in population, overall from the time period between 1940 and 2010, overall the population was seen to trend downwards. Um, next slide, please. So um, on the left, you can see the previous goals that I mentioned. And on the right, you can see the uh, slightly updated and prioritized goals. So with the help of our RPA uh, policy board and technical committee, 
we kind of refine these goals a little bit and arrange them in order of the priorities that they expressed. So at the top, you have safety and security um, and um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, and, you know, the goal is to enhance safety and security, not just for motorized, but for mo non-motorized users of the transportation system. Second priority is to enhance uh, transportation options, meaning increased accessibility and mobility, and also making it easier to connect between different modes and different choices that are available. And then to the preservation component, we added uh, resilience because um, it's becoming more and more important to be able to recover from natural disasters such as flooding. And then the economic vitality portion, obviously promoting um, economic development, but also enhancing travel and tourism. And then lastly, looking at um, land use and growth, and we kind of com combine that with a, instead of a more environmental focus, maybe more sustainability. So things like energy conservation um, and being looking at how communities are growing and how economic development is occurring and sort of um, planning transportation enhancements around those things. Uh, next slide, please. So right now we're in the early phase. Uh, so we're gathering public input. We uh, basically want to hear what you guys have to say. And we're doing that up until the spring of 2025. Then we'll have our we'll work on our initial draft up until the summer. And then there'll be a period for public comment for about a month next summer. And then we'll work on the final draft and present that to the Iowa DOT um, in October of uh, next year. Next slide, please. So basically today what we're looking for is what's important to you. What, what do you think needs to be included in this a long range transportation plan? What are the biggest needs and priorities uh, for this region for the next 25 years? Um, and any other thoughts and comments you might have? Next slide, please. So we kind of um, color coded our goals. Again, these are in the order of the, in the priority order that we determined from our um, meetings with our um, policy board and technical committee. Uh, we color coded them because we have uh, a map. Ex we have a couple maps that we're going to let you look at. And then we have some stickers that are color coded according to these categories. So you'll be able to put a sticker. So if you have a concern or something you want to see in the future related to economic development, you'll use a green sticker and put it on the map and show us where exactly you um, you want to see that happening or you think needs to be taken into consideration. So we have, um, we'll come back to the slide for the map exercise, um, but next slide. So uh, we also have flyers that we'll let you uh, take if you like. And on there, there's our contact information as well as there'll be a QR code on the flyers that'll take you to this website and you can take a survey. It's pretty easy, pretty quick. Um, there are questions to answer, but then there's also opportunity to um, for further input. And there's a map, you can click on it and show us exactly where you have concerns or where you'd like to see things in the future. And then there's also the option to tell us what, what type of, what category those fall into. Is it pedestrian? Is it um, transit? And so on. So I think that's all we have until we do our our map exercise. Thank you. When is that map exercise? We brought um, logistically. I, I think um, we have maps, and we invite anyone here today uh, to just meet us in the back and just have a chat, uh, and we can work on the map exercise. Uh, if you're timing, more, your timing is great because we've got advanced Southwest Iowa at the table. Excellent. So we can tell you exactly where the growth needs to be. Yeah, and right now we just open it up for your discussion or any questions you might have. Uh, and then when you guys are done with the meeting, we'll be in the back, come to find us, we'll be here. I got two questions. Okay. Increase in farming activity. How we're becoming more urbanized within Western Pottawatomie County. Mm -hmm. Where do you see us increasing farm activity? And I think that was um, in relation to the last LRTP. Uh, we'll take a look at it this year or this go round. Um, but I think what that was really looking at was increased activity of trucking through the area. Uh, I, I think that's what it was. I'll have to double check and make sure. We've got a lot of trucks here. Yeah, okay, and a lot of it is, is farm based. Bike trails. Mm -hmm. yeah. That included in there? 
Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So if we if we advance like we're supposed to, we'll be driving George Jetson cars when we need. <laughs> I've been promised that since the 80s. Yeah, okay, okay. You don't see him yet? <laughs> Haven't seen him yet. Okay. I could I could spend all day talking to you two. Excellent. So I'm, I'm just going to give an example right now. My wife and I moved to uh, uh, Trainer, Iowa in 95. Uh, uh, she took an executive position with a business in downtown Omaha. Trainer's about 15 miles from downtown Omaha. She got to work faster in the mornings than those who worked downtown living in West Omaha. Mm -hmm. Okay, faster. Uh, and so at, at this point, uh, you know, uh, you're looking at uh, uh, professionals coming into the Omaha area with the uh, UNFC. Uh, where do they live? Where, isn't it, wouldn't it be a natural progression to look at Council Bluffs, those who work in, in Omaha, basically uh, live in Council Bluffs and facilitate the transportation modes for those who want to live in Iowa, work in our living council less work in Omaha. Is that, is that what you're looking at too? Uh, not under this LRTP. So this one is really focused on the non-urbanized area of okay. Potawatomi. Uh, let me put on my other hat. Okay, I have my other hat. This is my MPO hat. As part of the urbanized area, the MPO is working with the city of council bluffs to look at different transportation and multimodal options. Uh, we're also doing a similar long-range transportation plan for the urbanized area as well. So we have a lot of similarities. This uh, RPA 18 just has a different geographic focus. Um, but many of the concerns and issues are going to be similar. Uh, really looking at um, how do we enhance or what does our transportation network look like 50 years from now or 25 years from now. So by 2050, what do we want to see? Obviously, I'm going to take that and play flying cars <laughs> to heart because I've been promised those for a while. <laughs> um, and that would reduce some of our maintenance anyway. Um, but we are looking at issues with regards to how people are moving in and around the region, whether it's from the urbanized area to the non-urbanized area. Um, this RPA plan is really focusing on that non-urbanized area and seeing what what issues come up. And as John and uh, Commissioner uh, Miller know, we talk about this ad nauseum at our RPA policy and technical committee meetings. Um, and during the fall, we open up a call for projects to um, help prioritize and disperse federal funds that come to the region. And so there are additional conditions to those federal funds. Certain class of roadways have to be met. So it has to be an urban or a non-urban collector and above is able to be funded. Local roads and local bridges are not part of that funding mix for that. Um, maybe future transportation projects or future transportation bills from the federal government might look at that. But at this time, that's some of the conditions. Yes. West Fair. We need to turn lane out there. <laughs> we need that so bad. Uh, yeah, that's huge. You were talking about population. Mm -hmm. uh, Ottawa mm -hmm. County, you say, uh, population-wise is decreasing. Is that what I understand? The region, during the last, when they worked on, it wasn't us, it was the pre our predecessors that did the 2045 long-range transportation plan. The demographic data they were looking at, so this would have been in 2019, 2020. Because we're, yeah. we're, we're, uh, we're hearing from people who are looking at the Omaha Council Bus metro area, mm -hmm. and collectively I'm talking the metro area, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Council Bus could, could grow exponentially in the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and that includes Pottawatomie County, because I hear mm -hmm. from a lot of people that move to Pottawatomie, the rural areas of Pottawatomie mm -hmm. County, you know, there's, there's more housing. Uh, that's being built in the, our, our rural communities mm -hmm. as we speak. So, so what was true back then, you're not necessarily seeing as true today. Is that correct? Is it's that what I'm hearing? Possible, yeah. yeah. And most of the information comes from the U.S. Census, the decennial census, and then projections from that or samples from that. And so, this plan is going to look at from the 2020 census. And you know, I'll put a caveat in there. The 2020 census was a bit different uh, than normal censuses, uh, just because it was during our pandemic period. And so some of the numbers are a little bit interesting to see. Um, but since then, some of the um, 
projections and some of the samples have uh, course corrected. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're going to look at. From the last uh, census population data that I had for the county, I believe the county total number had gone down by a couple thousand. Um, so it's been kind of pretty flat and kind of downward trend uh, overall. And that's for the entire county. Uh, we'll break it down further as we get deeper into our data analysis. Uh, and if that's information you would like, happy to send that along. And what other counties you say were Mills County is one? Mills? Montgomery County? Uh, no, Harrison and Shelby. Harrison and, and Shelby. Shelby, correct. Okay. Uh, you know, Pottawatomie County, I, I meet with the uh, supervisors of the regional uh, county, uh, counties. Uh, and Pottawatomie County has advantage that they don't. Pottawatomie County's tax base is still expanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, I, I talked to the, uh, the to the supervisor for Shelby County, for instance. Uh, they have a challenge every year, budget-wise, because they are continuing to lose their tax base. That's something that Pottawatomie County really doesn't experience. You know, we're, we're, we're holding our own for the budget, as budget, the tax base and budgets. So uh, what you're looking to do is increase, you know, the awareness in all of, in, in that whole region. Is that correct? And we are the hub. I mean, yeah, we're the we're the intersection of 80 and 29, right? So we are the the transportation hub of this whole area. Mm -hmm. All right. So and that's our advantage. Yes. Okay. And you're going you're going to exploit that advantage for us. I okay. wouldn't say exploit, but we'll look at what issues are persistent through here. And so some of the main concerns we've heard uh, leading up to this point uh, have been gravitating towards these safety concerns, roadway safety. And that's an interest that is spread throughout uh, the US right now. So things like vulnerable road users, so people on motorcycles, people walking and biking, uh, getting hit uh, and uh, suffering severe fatal crashes, those numbers have increased in the last couple of years. And so there's a lot more interest and in, uh, federal funding available to counteract some of those concerns. So that's one of the key things that we're trying to tease out with data and information. Uh, where are these crashes taking place? How can we uh, put in interventions and work with our local en engineers on improving and enhancing our transportation network to prevent some of these fatal and severe crashes? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming in this morning. Thank you for having this presentation. Yeah. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll be in the back. All right. Be next to Paula Hazelwood. Focus on TRF. <laughs> All right, Paula Hazelwood, CEO and Shalimar Mazetas, Rural Developer, Rural Development Manager for Advanced Southwest Iowa Corporation. You've got an economic development and update for us. You do, correct. So good morning. Um, as Shell and I typically do on a regular basis, coming in to give you uh, Advanced Southwest Iowa's year-to-date activity report. So I'm going to talk about um, just what the project pipeline looks like um, and more so some of our landed projects that we've worked on for a said number of time, but we've been able to actually successfully land those um, in, in 2024. And then the projects that I am going to talk about specifically are four counts of bluffs proper. Jalmar will report on um, the more rural projects that she's working on. Uh, so again, I always like to preface this, we track everything. So everything we do, we have a CRM system, we track in, we also have a backup plan. We have a uh, shared spreadsheet that all of us utilize just to make sure that our numbers are matching between the system um, and you know what we're reporting in our, our backup database. Um, so as of uh, July 31st, 2024, we have uh, currently have 54 projects in our active pipeline. Now that encompasses those that I'm working on in Council Bluffs directly, those that Shalimar is working on, and entrepreneurial projects that Nikki Ferguson is working on uh, for all of Pottawatomie County. So that could be urban or, or rural. Um, we have landed 11 projects in 2024. That equivalates to 94.5 um million dollars in capital investment. 
um, 161 new and or retained jobs. So some of the projects that we have landed, um, Acadia is currently under construction at 24th and Richard Downing. If you're not familiar, it is a 90-bed uh, uh, medical facility for substance abuse and mental health. Um, and so again, they are under construction and, and well, going. That, that is yes, going. Yes, that is okay. what's being built on the corner of 24th and okay. Mr. Downey. I just hadn't seen it. Yet. Yeah. So we were able to um, help them from the very beginning, and we worked with their site selection team specifically as it related to uh, local and state incentives for the project. And I think they're having a ribbon cutting on a Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Yes, so, ma'am, they are. So the I think will... in two, maybe two weeks from today, which you guys, um, hopefully maybe one of you can excuse yourself and attend that. That might be a, a good meeting to look. Yeah, but we can work on that. Um, I will tell you that I've seen the um, initial renderings of that uh, project for the building. It's a beautiful building. It's secured. Um, you know, obviously secured access points at all all locations and just a really, really nice, beautiful facility that'll be great for that corner right there. I'll be so far a lot. <laughs> you have a spillover for the for the yeah. the baseball and soccer fields yeah. over there. Um, that is something they actually did discuss, and that's probably a very fair question that they've maybe over accommodated on parking a little bit. Really? Yeah. 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 They, they were very open to those discussions from the beginning, so I don't think there's going to be any issue, especially on the weekends. It's going to be limited staff. Right. The residents obviously don't have vehicles, so that could be a, a really good alternative. Uh, it's, it's pretty much Monday through Sunday. <clears throat> right. Yeah, exactly. So, sorry, I'm not checking my emails. I have my um, notes on my phone, and it just went haywire. So that is currently under construction, and again, um, with the ribbon cutting you know, or the groundbreaking ribbon cutting, I hope that um, somebody is able to attend from the, the county. Um, Barton Solvents is on 9th Avenue. There are also currently under construction. That office building is, um, I believe, almost completely done. And so based on their growth projections, um, they built a new office structure. It's just 5,000 square feet, but much needed space for, for their uh, executive and admin staff. Um, and then they're going to take their existing space that they've been utilizing for those functions in their current building on 9th Avenue and turn that into more of a work area for their employees, break area, training area, and those type of things. So it's actually a, a win-win all the way around. Yeah, and employees too? Um, no, not at this point, Scott. No. Okay. It's just basically a capital investment project um, and their employee accounts pretty much remain the same. Um, I will talk about Project Summit, which is a, a project that um, Shalimar or uh, Nikki Ferguson worked on. It is a new um, coffee shop that is going to be actually it's under construction as well in uh, uh, where Baumgarts is in the parking lot, Sherwood Plaza. And so Nikki has worked with uh, the owners of that from the very beginning, and it's called Frosted Pine. And matter of fact, I just saw this morning, it came out on social media that they're at, they actually put out a request to hire some employees, So, which is really good. Obviously, a small employee base, but that area right now, we've had so many requests from people coming in, you know, from the various rural areas that pass through and want to, hey, why don't we have a coffee shop here? So obviously there's going to be one. Oh, um, no. They, Yeah, and they worked with the owners um, of the complex to make sure that the drive-through was adequate to meet, you know, the, the, the stacks that may come through there. So they're not stacking onto that main kind of thoroughfare through, through Sherwood. So that should be good. It's veteran and woman owned. Yes, veteran, veteran owned. Yep. Um, and then Project Park is a project that I've been working on for quite some time, and it has to do with the sale of the Iowa Western Community College site, the 90 acres that sits just east of their campus. And so the phase one was actually the sale from Iowa Western um, to the developer that purchased it. So we were able to land that earlier this year. That actually happened. Um, at the very end of December last year, but we land, we actually landed it in January. But um, we continue to work on that site, but only now with an end user um, in tow. And I'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, project Leading Edge, I want to talk about this just real quick. So um, 
I started working with a manufacturing company, very cool company located just off of Ninth Avenue. Um, they've been a long time business here. The, the father started it, the, the second generation took over, um, put some innovation to it, and then had the, the need to expand. And so, um, again, Sherwood Plaza, kind of that end cap where bomb guards used to be. So Echo Electric had been leasing that, but I knew that they were getting ready to, they're building their new facility um, south of town, uh, new warehouse distribution. So I knew that they were going to be vacating that. And so I started working with all of them kind of collectively and the building owner and what transpired was kind of cool. So the Ninth, in, uh, Ninth Avenue, sorry, I got braces the other day and I'm still trying to figure out how to talk with these darn things. The Ninth Avenue um, manufacturer that I started working with connected them with the building owner, took them out to the facility, toured the facility. Echo was very gracious and allowed us to do that while they were still in the facility. Um, and lo and behold, they were able to sign a lease. So Echo expanded, moving south. That Ninth Avenue company moved into the Echo space. Um, and now the other side of the manufacturing equation that the father still owns is expanding at the Ninth Avenue site. So it's kind of one of those full circle projects that we don't get. To, I mean, it doesn't happen often, but it actually all worked out accordingly. And everybody's happy. Everybody's in their new space and it's going well. Where on Ninth Avenue is it? Um, so, so you know where the seven, big sub station is that sits, I can't remember like what the cross. 17. Yeah, yeah, right in that area. Yep. Exactly. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. They do binding, like book, yep. book binding. And, yep. yeah, but there's two pieces to it. So it's a very, very cool project. So they're they're actually in their new space now at out at Sherwood. Okay. So And then uh, just recently, so I've been working with uh, TSL, which is a logistics company since 2018, and a lot of moving parts on that, specifically as it related to uh, state and federal funding for transportation. So I was glad our MAPA folks were here. Um, but we were able to secure some of that, but things kind of, you know, um, slowed down a little bit during COVID. And we just now um, got to land phase number one, which is about 11 and a half million. It's a transmodal facility. So phase number one is really just putting in the concrete that they need. So if you are going down Harry Langdon, South Avenue shoots off of Harry Langdon and kind of makes that loop around. Um, TSL owns a building down there, but then they also ha uh, bought a site that's adjacent to the Iowa Interstate Rail Yard. And so that's where they're putting this new intermodal facility at. And phase one will be the concrete pad that will obviously store all of their, their stackable containers. Um, they will have a security hut. And then phase number two will be much more into the intermodal and kind of warehouse distribution piece. So that'll be potentially another 30 million. there too, million. Carlos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really bad. We, we need a whole new routing system right there as, as South yes. Avenue circles. And I know because I live out in that area. And so I drive by that every single day and have seen some pretty close calls well, at times. From there, from there out to the intersection of 92 all needs to be. Yeah. Well, and I can assure you that Matt Cox, the director of public works for the city of Council Bluffs, um, he has been involved in numerous conversations and, and that is is still actively, I would say, being discussed at some point that whole, you know, area uh, needs to be redone, mm -hmm. the entrance access points. So I mean, really, yeah. it needs to go further south, all the way down Cl closer to Bungie. the it needs to go all the way down to the Bungie, to be honest with you, because the next intersection by Lewis Central, where the middle school is, is, is a nightmare. That is also being discussed right now, and, and I'll talk about that in, in some of the more specific projects but that I'm working on. But then further up. south, it doesn't get a whole lot better to get the interchange down there. No, it doesn't. You see it almost every day, especially when school's in session. I mean, it is. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. It gets to be yeah. crazy in that yeah. area, I know, for sure. Well, there's a lot of you know, development, housing, and stuff going on down there. There's a ton, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff. So um, TSL now, again, we're working on phase two, so that'll be more of the intermodal facility pieces. Um, our cold storage project that was slated for East South Manawa Drive, um, they have an option on that property through November of this year. Um, we are not sure yet if that project is going to move forward or not. We have reached out to them, and I think, Scott, you had asked me about that at one time. Um, they well, I know, but they were still working on it, and they had an end user in tow. That end user backed off. 
Um, they try to incorporate and find another one that has not, as of today, been successful. Um, but, you know, here's the thing with that site. The studies have been done. The real study's been done. The power study's been done. And so um, for us to be able to cite a user there, to me, it makes perfect sense. It needs to, it absolutely needs to be a real user because that is one of our very last real surf sites in, in Council Bluffs proper. And so um, I would pose this to our map of friends in the back as well. Um, if real is not included in your rural study, if it could be, that would be amazing. Um, but, you know, to, to put somebody there that is not going to utilize the full capacity of the infrastructure would be a waste. So we're working on that. We're hoping to get a meeting with the actual developers that have it under option and find out what their next steps or intentions are for the property. Because if they're going to let it go, I've got a, a list of companies that would be interested in it like that. So we'll yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, that Say that again. Be it in. It is. Be in. Yep, exactly right. And typically, I've always worked with UP, but this one and another project that we're working on happened to be BN, and they have a really great local contact that we've worked great, just wonderfully with. So, yep. Um, the property that is just north of Iowa Western Community College on Hunt Avenue, which is owned by the Council Bluffs Industrial Foundation, it has been under option with a warehouse distribution company. Um, the city and I have been, Courtney Harder specifically from community development, we've been working with those folks for quite some time. They had a plan, they were gonna do spec building there. They came back, they changed their model. They kind of changed the, the layout of, of the facilities themselves and the sizes. And so basically we're at a point where um, reached out to them this week and said, okay, well, we can't really help you. We can help you. We've helped them for several years, two years now, but we can't analyze like what the local incentives or anything will be until we have their revised numbers and their site plan. And so they are supposed to send that to Courtney and I, and we'll review that and, and then get back in contact with them to further review and figure out what needs to happen. We have a lot of technology interest right now. It's not just Council Bluffs, but because of what we already have here relating to technology, it it is kind of on steroids at this point. But all across the state of Iowa, um, this is going on. And it's the larger AI users that are looking for large, very high megawatt usage sites. And so Mid-American Energy, as I talk about some of these other ones, they have um, rightfully so, step back. They're analyzing their grid, their power sources. Obviously, they don't want to commit power to a big data center user if it's going to uh, cause issues with you as the household consumer. And so they're really analyzing everything from start to finish. Um, so some of these projects are taking a little bit longer, but without the power, the projects don't happen. And so um, I think they're at a good point now. It'll probably, probably be a couple more weeks before we have solid answers for some of our AI interest um but it's in the works so which is good and i mean you hear from the state as far as power I mean, that's a huge issue for not council bluffs or pot county but pretty much this midwest you know well i think it's um really going to come down to again mid-american who doesn't serve all of iowa but they certainly nope, serve they us uh analyzing everything but some of it is going to whereas Previously, I would say the, the technology users, I mean, they've obviously put capital investment in, but the infrastructure companies like Midam and Black Hills Energy, even local municipalities that run infrastructure have bared the burden of running those extensions and those costs. And I think if these companies, and they're going to continue to grow, if we don't capture them, somebody else is going to. So I would rather them look at us and, and we become a technology hub versus, you know, they go to South Dakota or some other place that, you know, and we never see them again. Um, but I think that these companies are going to have to start bearing the burden of some of those additional infrastructure costs as it relates. I also think that um, renewables and sustainables are going to be something else that's looked at to power some of these and they, they have new technology. I mean, every time you blink your eye, they have a new set of technology that they're following. So we have a couple companies right now where they used to be extremely water intensive. They're not anymore. I mean, they basically, a campus data center can run off domestic water usage now just because of the new technology. So there's a lot of things back and forth, but we'll have to see how it plays out. Yeah. 
And I, I just told Mitty, I'm, I'm going to keep bringing these to you until you tell me to stop. Power's huge. Yeah, it's huge. It's, you know, average 250, 300 megawatt users. It's <laughs> tremendous. Appalachia and Southwest Iowa meet. We talked with the representative from Midian. Midian. Mm -hmm. And he said at this time, they're doing well with power. They're not concerned about taking too much power for these units. They have proactively planned. Time. Now, you can, you know, everybody wishes we had the crystal ball and you could plan, okay, in 2024, you're just going to get like inundated with. Mm -hmm. 15, you know, technology inquiries, you, you can't plan that, but all of our utility partners have been very proactive in, in, in planning the best that they can to accommodate, you know, not only the technology, but some of the larger manufacturing that is now coming back from overseas. So they've been planning these things for a while and, you know, securing the extra infrastructure that they need, not to say it can accommodate everything that we have, it's still going to have to ramp up and additional infrastructure is going to have to go in via transmission. Do you know anything about the new <clears throat> plants that the, the smaller, the, 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 you know, energy mm -hmm. generation plants that they're talking about uh, that could go in for, for, you know, for one company, for instance, they have their own nuclear gen uh, electrical generation uh, facility. I, you know, I've, I've been hearing a lot about that. I am not, um, I am not up to speed on that technology, nor are we working any projects that have um, that have wanted to use that type of technology. The only thing I know about nuclear power stations is when I was the economic development person in Washington County, they recommissioned the Fort Calhoun station right. to 2033, and then a year later, they decommissioned the whole thing. So that's the only exposure I've ever had to that type of you know technology. There's, there's new, but, there's new yeah. ways to, to generate electricity using nuclear uh, means They're, and it's right. it's gaining a lot of a well lot of and that's you know one of those flexibility pieces that some of the technology companies who typically want 100 percent sustainable energy may have to think through again whether they you know maybe they only get 80 percent sustainable energy and another 20 percent comes from what they would call you know not sustainable but I'm holding them out west jeff are those are one of the flexible i i am not um an expert on that for sure well, I'm, I'm certainly uh, I'm certainly not in favor of more windmills in Pottawatomie County, for instance. You talk about renewable energy. That's not a process I'm in favor of, period. Uh, okay. So I don't know what they're talking about. These days, I don't know what they're talking about. Well, natural gas would be one of them. Natural gas would be fine. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, the technology, I think, is still somewhat in its infancy. So it's, you know, but those those are things that probably will have to be okay. talked about. Just another quick question. You, you deal with Council Bluffs. Absolutely. City, yes, okay. sir. And maybe you've talked about it, but I didn't hear it. Uh, the uh, old Amazon warehouse, is that empty? Well, first of all, it's not old. It's relatively new. Oh, it was open. only built a few years ago. Um, it opened um, right before November of not this past Christmas, but the Christmas before, so they could accommodate the holiday. And basically what I've been told is they've already decided to uh, completely renovate the interior and make it a last mile facility versus more of a long haul facility. And so it is closed again, it's being renovated internally. Okay, because I heard they were going to tear it down. Oh just, goodness, that's... I don't know where you heard that <laughs> false rumor from, but Somebody do you does. know what the capital investment on that? That would be yeah, just I, crazy. I, I could imagine that. I couldn't no. imagine that being empty. For well, me. I would say that if you hear that rumor again, please stomp it down because that is absolutely not correct. Um, and then we do have a very, very large manufacturing project that we're working on um, that is looking at the 192nd Street corridor. Um, I want to thank Matt Wyatt for working on us, working on this project with us. But there's a lot of moving parts to it, a lot of infrastructure pieces working both with Mills County, the City of Council Bluffs, obviously Pottawatomie County, trying to piece everything together. Um, but this would be a very, very good project for that corridor. It will open up infrastructure all the way to the border where it uh, that encompasses Bungie Avenue right there. There's currently no sanitary sewer that runs the perimeter of that. There's water, but it's dedicated water. Um, so it will open up a lot of opportunities with the potential of paving and maybe straightening out 192nd Street properly. Um, because as a, you know, as you said, coming out the opposite end there by mm -hmm. Lewis Central School District, it gets to be crazy with the buses, the trucks that are in and out of there. So, you know, redoing 
uh, 192nd Street, hopefully with John in tow as well, um, would be a good another access point option. Um, this is a great project and um, they actually will be back and they've been in town three times now. They'll be back at the end of August again to have a series of meetings with all of the people that are um, playing a role in this project. That would possibly become part of the city. Well, correct. It's, I mean, I can't Google, speculate. No, at this I know, point, but I mean, Google's yeah. in the city. Yes, that is absolutely correct. I mean, and obviously for the city to commit to putting the infrastructure in, there has to be some. Sure. So, yes, those are all Paula, pieces that we're working on. Wouldn't that be a rail? access point to there is the nsf there and this company that's why they want this site because they need rail okay. yes yeah. yeah um are you guys doing working with or doing anything for mount crescent or the home or the council plus here just questions i have worked um we obviously promote mount crescent on a regular basis just through our our regular marketing endeavors so anything the county puts out publicizing anything that's happening there, we grab it. And, and I say we, I mean, Nikki Ferguson, she's our social media guru. She grabs it and she reposts it. And we do that for all of our partners. Um, and then the Council Plus Airport, um, I've had kind of sporadic back and forth with them. They were developing a, a plan out there. I worked with John um, on his building, trying to negotiate with them a little bit on the front side um, with Andy Biller. Um, but no, I mean, I don't have a ton of activity with well, them at this point. They need to become a major airport facility for the region. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, I think their plan, they, they've got a long, long range plan that looks to be a great plan for if you're looking for a major faci airport facility in the region, they got the plan. They do. They have and a very I, nice facility. Yes. And very I don't, nice know, I, I don't know if there's anything you can do or your your organization can do for them. We we so. have. We've offered that on numerous occasions. And I mean, you know, I actually um, am very close to one of their board members out there. So I talk to her on a regular basis. And as things come up, I provide advice or whatever. But, you know. I'll talk to them. See if there's, see if there's anything they, they need. Yes. And then we'll go, you know. That would be great. Just develop a two-way street. Yep. Just let me know. Um, just really quickly, a couple of other things because I want Shell to have plenty of time to give her update. Um, so I talked about the manufacturing company, and then um, we do have a, another large uh, technology company that um, is putting in an option on about 70 acres um, here in Council Plus proper. And I think that option actually went in yesterday. And we have two uh, companies, smaller companies, one tech and then an engineering company that are looking at space in the River's Edge building. Um, one of them, uh, I actually submitted their letter of interest last night for that space, and that would be first floor. And then the other one would be the fourth floor um, adjacent to the Iowa West facility. So we have a couple of other things going on as well, but I'm going to ask Shal to do her update and then we'll take any additional questions that you have. Taking all the time. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> there, we have a lot going on. Okay. I mean, a lot. No, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Good morning. Okay. So, um, first things first, I want to start with Minden recovery. Um, I, you know, think maybe everyone feels like this, but I think we're really special. Um, I think that everyone has come through for Minden in miraculous, wonderful ways. I think um, Pot County management has, emergency management has done a great job. Um, I think the community rallying, I mean, I think last I heard we had raised $150,000 that we're able to give out grants. It's really incredible what's happened in Minden and Pot County showing up and being, you know, Susan was on the phone with me the next morning, ready to see how we could help with all of you backing her. So, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. It has made all the difference to have everybody full support, full steam ahead, get stuff done, make a big impact, make it better. Right. So um, on that note, it's been really busy. Uh, we have been working um, a ton with everybody. I call it the alphabet soup. So we've got all of the alphabet agencies involved. Um, they've all come out to check out the facility, to check out what's going on, to see the damage, write reports, um, see what kind of assistance and help we can get. One of the biggest things that came out of this was actually Supervisor Miller um, came up with this idea of how are we going to support them? This isn't just a short-term thought process, but it's a long-term thought process. So how do we support them for the next two years? Because you can't put 
rebuilding an entire community on a volunteer mayor and a city clerk whose jobs are already very in labor intensive in the first place. Um, and so we came up with the idea to do a Minden Disaster Recovery and Resiliency Program Manager is what the name is. Um, I think we're going to find a way to shorten that somehow, but we'll get there with what it's called later. Um, but we went out for RFQ on that um, about three weeks ago, and then um, we had it open for three for two weeks, and we only got one response back, and that was accepted at the um, J July... Uh, 23rd meeting? Is that right? 30th. The July 30th meeting. Sorry, I'm getting all these dates. Um, it was accepted by the city council that they have voted to hire McClure for that piece. So ideally what that's going to look like is somebody for the city to rely on to create ordinances, enforce code, help with building permits, help with figuring out if there's if there's a bunch of people selling a, a couple lots of land, do we need to rethink how that's done and maybe put in some senior housing? Is that what we do with it next? Um, there's several different granting sources and funding sources that are coming from the state level. So from IPA, from IEDA, um, from USCA, from EDA as well. Um, we're going to need somebody to manage all of those different grant programs, the reporting back and the dollars spent and where it went and et cetera. So that's everything that person's going to be doing. Um, I'm really excited to see it. I'm excited about it being um, McClure. It's, so it's going to be Bethany Wilcoxon with McClure that's going to do that. And um, <coughs> we are currently trying to capital stack um, what we think, how much we're going to need to have to pay McClure for that. So um, I might be coming back to you guys in a week or two and asking for some assistance with that. So I'll keep you posted. Talk about where the initial funding came from. The initial funding came from... Um, Huh? iWest Foundation, yes. Yeah. iWest Foundation has been lock and step with Pot County in anything they can do to to get this to recovery and resiliency. Along with um, United Way has also committed, they initially committed $5,000 to kind of help get them through that initial month, um, which of course they spent way more than that, but we they didn't get charged for it, which was really nice of the engineering company to do that. Um, and then uh, uh, the United Way is also committed an extra $70,000 towards this program manager, whatever that is. So um, I'll be coming back to you guys and letting you know. Any questions on Minden Recovery? Because I know that's a hot topic. So Are there some state funds available for that type of... Um, Yes and no. Development side. Right now, what we're doing is we're working with all of the alpha. Now that we have this person in place, we need to figure out how to pay for them. Um, but once we have that done, now that we have this person in place, there's so many funds from so many different areas to pay for things. We want to be sure that we're using the right fund in the right way. So there's certain funds that we probably shouldn't use for certain things because while it's allowed, they're going to be a giant problem to use those funds for that thing. <laughs> so we should use the funds where they're not going to be so problematic. Does that make sense? Yeah. So is, is, it, is, it, is, the, is it a team or is it just a person? It's it's the whole McClure engineering. We've so got a team. But a dedicated person. So we have one uh, yeah, dedicated well, person. Well, 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 yes. 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 We have one dedicated person that's going to help them for the next two years is how it looks. So... And I think that that's, I mean, I know that the city clerk and uh, Teresa Tenner and Kevin Zimmerman, the mayor, are both ecstatic and over the moon. I was out in Minden and, and when the governor was out there. And so we had a discussion, a group discussion. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I said at that time, I think, of course, that uh, this could actually be an opportunity for Minden. And she agreed. Yes. And so kind of that's how you're looking at it too, is that correct? A thousand percent. Okay. And, I, and I think that putting this person in place gives Minden that an opportunity to capitalize on everything the very best they can. That's what I'm talking about. There could be funds to pay for this. We want to figure out how to pay for it the best way possible. Um, but this is a huge opportunity for Minden to expand, grow, boom, come back even better, bigger and better. And that's where our goal is. Now, there's several. There's several. Well, not several. There's a couple. Very large corporations that have facilities close to Minden Island. Jack's Lakes is one, Nard is another. Are, are those companies able, or have you have you discussed anything that the possibilities of maybe those companies helping Minden out? Um, as of now, no, that hasn't been a discussion, and they haven't reached out to us to offer assistance. Well, I stopped at so. Jack. I was out there to see the governor. I stopped in at Jack's Lakes just to see what the possibilities are. Uh, they, of course, they, they re referred me to their corporate office in uh, Chicago. Something like that. But I certainly would think that 
companies that have facilities that, that close to Minn and Iowa, I, I think they would be certainly willing to to have some kind of a opportunity to, to help. It, I, I don't it wouldn't surprise me if some of those companies have given, you know, through the the, the fund, the Potawatomi County Foundation Fund, um, in some capacity, and probably I would say their employees as well. So, but we there's so many other resources out there as it relates to state and federal funding that trying to sift through all of that. Um, and then let people make their own personal donations. And and while we were out there, I think Brian, you were out there too, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And while we were talking, uh, the, the one discussion that they were having is the red tape involved in all of this federal funding, you know, yeah. state and federal funding. They were trying to find ways to work around that red tape. Yeah, that's what this person is going to do. There's, there's no workaround. There, there aren't workarounds, but there are reports that you can file. There are ways and there are relationships that you can capitalize on. Part of the reason we were we wanted McClure to do this was because of their relationships in Des Moines, that they can make personal phone calls and to certain agencies, yeah, and in DC to certain agencies to get things done. Um, and but so, ethically, the way yeah. that they should be well, done. Not, not, we're not cutting red tape. We're no. just we're, there's a way to do yeah. there's a way to operate inside government funding right. that takes a lot of time that we couldn't ask a city clerk to do, but we can ask. McClure. Yeah, it's just it's it's a it's a it's, a, um, it's how they were. You know, who's asking for funds and 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 and, so, and, and the process of of getting funding, and yeah. again, I mean, there's things that and red tape enters into that real quick when you're talking federal and, yeah. and state agencies, and they were talking discussing ways to maybe you know do do different processes to where they don't have as much red tape to deal with. Well, and it doesn't it, it doesn't help curtail, but that's what we're talking about in after we fit capital stack and get McClure get their find their proposal and get it officially you know sign on the dotted line. Um, part of this person is going to be if we use FEMA funding for a water treatment plant, yes. because the water treatment plant was not up to code, we will have to fill out 87 different forms and go through six months of waiting. If we instead use EDA funding for that and use the FEMA funding for the this, then all of a sudden it makes it to where everything is not cleaner. I, I think they were talking about. So that's that's exactly what this person is supposed to be doing and is and is going to be a, a, aware of and working through it at the time. And it's going to create a great playbook for them. Yeah. Even if another community doesn't have a disaster, but they need a water treatment plant, we're going to be able to capitalize on what was done for Minden and recreate it a lot quicker and simpler in yeah. some of the other communities. Yeah. My, my hope is that through this, we're able to build Minden back in such a way that we're talked about like Joplin is and you know some of the other towns that have had just massive destruction to their towns about how wonderfully they came back. I would love for us to be the playbook for Iowa and for us to share that with everyone of this is how EMA responded, this is how IEDA responded, this is how IPA responded and give other communities the playbook at any given point in time. Sure. Hats off, you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. We've it's been it's been a lot, but it's been really wonderful. So, like I said, it's been amazing to see what our county is uh, capable of. Well, and it's been a huge relief that you guys have taken the front seat for that and driving it forward. Yeah. That, thank you. Like it's a difference. It's been we we've been happy to serve in that role. We're excited that we can take a go to a little bit more of a back seat once this is all done. But we've we've been happy to serve. So. Um, we've got housing plans, we've got funding that's going to come from the state in a couple different ways, and we'll address all of that later and hopefully be coming to you guys with a plan coming up here soon. RPCIC, we just had our biannual check-in with the RPCIC, so the Rural Potawatomi County Infrastructure Coalition. Um, all of the projects are on track and are doing well, with the exception of Minden's is still moving forward and their project is still looking good. It's just with the roads and the tornado, it's kind of taken a back seat, but they were well ahead of schedule anyway. So all of our deadlines of September 2024 20, being allotted and, and December 2026 being completed are still perfectly on track with all of the projects. Um, we might have something that we need to rethink and redo for Crescent, and I might be bringing that to you soon. Um, so, because they are, think they're changing the way that they're going to be approaching their project. They're still doing the exact same thing. They're treating the water system that they need to treat, um, but they might be able to do it in a cheaper way that would actually make it affordable for them. So, new technology, new technology, and we are currently waiting with for DNR to get back to us on a Schedule G. 
and then we need a facility plan. And once the facility plan is approved, then I will be coming to you guys with probably an amended RPCIC and we'll be having a meeting, Scott, to talk about that beforehand as well. So, um, yeah. Uh, Empower Rural Iowa, I just wanted to update you guys really quickly on Empower Rural Iowa. Um, that's a board that I'm really excited to get to sit on that um, goes throughout the state and it's Lieutenant Governor's kind of pet project. Um, they are changing the uh, board from 66 to 25 people. So that's been an interesting thought process. Um, my term is set for the next three years, so I will be on it for the next three years, which is great and I'm excited to be there. Iowa United First Aid, which is the rural uh, emergency response that puts first responders um, directly in, Good Samaritan first responders directly next to um, whoever has it and it goes over the 911 system, is going really, really well. They piloted it for the first year in Calhoun, Cass, and uh, Van Buren counties. And it's been going really, really well. It's been going so well, in fact, that they've got a couple great success stories and they're going to do it for one more year before they open it up to other counties. I'm really hoping Pot County will be interested in applying for that and um, going in on the next round because I think it's something that's immensely helpful. And if you want to learn more about it, talk to me about it. I'd love to tell you. Um, rural housing assessment grant, child care grant, and plan child care planning grants, and the boost grants are all currently live. So um, my communities know about it. They are actively participating if they would like to. Um, the innovation grants are going through a change. And instead of just doing anything that has to do with innovation for the entire state, they're looking at specifically funding rural groceries in innovation. So how can a rural grocery store be innovative and do something that could help the rural grocery store actually become stay competitive and stay available in our rural communities? Um, as well as economic gardening, which goes for stage two businesses. So businesses that have already grown and they've gotten to a certain point, but they need to um, figure out other avenues of business to business sales. There's a nice um, thing that they can do called economic gardening, and that grant will help support the companies doing that, which then leads to if the company grows, the area grows. So um, uh, last week, we were able to host um, Amber Rogers, who is the no, new global team business lead for IEDA, and her replacement, who was a, is a business development manager, Anne McMahon, 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 or something like that. Um, they're both wonderful. We were able to tour them around all of the sites and facilities that we have in Council Bluffs, as well as go out to Minden and talk about some of the recovery efforts out there and show them kind of what was going on. But it's a great afternoon and it's yet again pointing out that we are making, we're getting Des Moines to come to us more and we are going to them more to create a cyclical relationship more so, so that we don't get forgotten about. Does she work, work under Deb Durham? Yes, Amber. Amber, does, Amber is directly underneath. So they redid a bunch of stuff, and I don't totally understand it all. But you met her. Yes, you've met her before. She's she's pretty yes, wonderful. I remember. Oh. Yeah, um, but her replacement, who is going to be our regions, is Anne. Um, so she's replacing Amber, and she will be our regions um, IEDA contact. And I just love that they are encouraging them to come out and have lunch with us, to be around, to check out our sites, to know what we have available, come to our grand openings, that kind of stuff. So. I like utilizing them as much as we can. Okay, uh, project updates. Um, Judge Ritter Distillery opened on, officially opened on August 2nd. If you haven't been out there, please go check it out. Um, it is a bourbon distillery that also does gin, vodka, and whiskey. Um, the vodka is delicious. Um, and the building is absolutely gorgeous and it can house about 125 people and it's available for rent as well. It's done impeccably beautifully. The building is gorgeous. It's a brand new building that looks old on downtown Carson. I mean, um, Susan Miller was there to speak at the grand opening. It's fabulous. Oh, so, the Airbnb. oh, and then there's three Airbnbs that are on the back side of it as well. Um, which is great because we really need that out in the Riverside area, especially because we have people coming in and stuff like that, that it's nice to have an option. We only have two in Macedonia right now, so it's nice to have a couple more options. Um, Project Dog House, I'm going, we have funding fully locked in for a dog care um, clinic and facility 
that is out just outside of Avoca that's expanding, which we're really excited to see. Um, I will be coming to you guys probably in the next month or so. Uh, Matt Wyant and Pot County has been incredibly helpful. This is a newer business owner that has needed a lot of handholding, and they have held her hand fabulously and helped her walk through all of the processes. So hopefully next month we'll be coming to you guys with um, a zoning change for that. That's, a, that, that's in the county or not in the county? It's in the county. Not in the city? No. Okay. Nope, it's in the county. Okay. But we got uh, we have support letters for the rezoning from the city as well. Okay. So we've we've crossed all of our I's, I think, and dotted most of our T's and waiting for the funding to be secured. We were able to fund it through Mid-States Bank and um, the Nishna Valley REC revolving loan program. So excited to see us taking more advantage of that. Um, Project Flats is second story housing that's going in in downtown Carson. We're working on a possible commu community catalyst program for that. I think that's going to be a really nice project. Um, and then Project CNA, which is CNA Scales, which was their entire building was completely wiped out in the Minden tornado. Um, they were about to expand and we said, hey, if you're expanding, let's get you incentives. Uh, we were able to get, they were awarded $105,856 in state incentives through high quality jobs program. Um, and it's a $2.5 million capital investment for their expansion. Where are they going? Back to Minden? They're going, they're going right in the same spot. They were going to cool. build a second building to Good. accommodate. Now they're just going to build one giant building. Good. I have to say thank you to IEDA and Paula Hazelwood for the immense help because this is a weird one. Like we have to navigate like what FEMA is covering, what insurance is covering, what, you know, and then they're building back one building instead of two. So there was a IEDA, IEDA had to do a lot of and Paula had to do a lot of configuring of, well, no, that was there and this isn't there. And so how do you, you so know. It's a number crunch. It was a lot of number crunching, but it, it worked great. And I'm really excited to see that we're getting some state incentives into rural Pottawatomie County. Sam start. When are they starting to build? Now. Yeah, it's all approved. Yeah. They're all signed. IEDA's board yeah. approved. Good to see them go They approved it on July 19th. Yep, July 19th. Um, and then lastly, uh, we are going to have some new commercial or industrial land, possibly up to 200 acres in Oakland available coming up here very shortly. So excited about that. And we're getting marketing materials put together um, to start advertising. Southside? Uh, yes. Southeast, yeah. Southeast. You, you, uh, you've heard about this. I'm going to be getting losing population, basically, according to the 2019 census. Right. Uh, but this is 2024, so you're not seeing population losses. No, it's been flat. They're absolutely correct. It's been flat and stagnant for a number of years, but I think we've had just a slight increase. But we all, we have a research department, so if you got, and those are things we, we regularly look at and run, but if you want to see any data, just reach out and let us know. Well, for instance, I think I think just, just recently we heard population moving from Oklahoma to as a positive, that's the first time that's happened. Ever. With the availability of potential housing, yeah. larger yeah. scale so, coming so down the pipe. That's, that's that's correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And the development and trainer that went off wonderfully, there's there's a couple of developments in Crescent that are consistently selling out before they're even done. Okay. You know, they've got a phase two planned already for the development and trainer. I, you know, uh, there's definitely, I think rural Pot County is showing its really beautiful side yeah. pretty nicely. We've heard that our out in the county, uh, meet and greets, and um, uh, spe specifically uh, uh, talking about the wind generation uh, and a lot of people moving to rural Ottawa County because it's such a beautiful, uh, you know, natural resource. Well, thank you guys so much you for know, the opportunity to let us come in. Thanks. I know we were extensive today, but we have a lot going on. Um, as you can hear, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or need, you know, any assistance on anything. We're there to help, and uh, we thank you for your continued support, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Michelle, where you did an excellent job on oh, yes, it. Really thank you. I thought it was pretty wonderful. We were excited. The pictures were dynamite. Yeah. yeah. Wida, Stacey Kinney with Wida did a fabulous job on the yeah. picture. Really nice. She's incredible. Thank you, we guys. We really figured out day. how to do grand opening. Sorry to whoever said you know. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bye. Thank you. Have, have a good day. day. Yep. Next up, Jana Limerick, Director of Human Resources, and Jim Franco, Executive Director, Conservation, Discussion, and our decision to approve new job description 
and pay for the position of chairlift operator team lead. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we've identified that we need a team lead um, for the chairlift operator area or division, if that's what you want to call uh, for Mount Crescent. We also, we already have snowmaking team leads, kitchen staff team leads, rental shop team leads. And so this is just another area where we'd like to have a team lead. The pay would be $16 to $19 an hour, which is what we're, we will be requesting in your next section for the other team leads. This position doesn't exist right now. Oh, but for the other team leads? What it is, the chair lift. there is no chairlift team lead today. We this talked is new. about that one time out at the lift. How you needed some more supervision out there. Right. Yeah. It's one of the big deals. You put someone on the lift and they don't know what they're doing. Right. Yeah. And it's a big operation. We have a lot of employees in a short number of months. And so you need someone to be in charge of scheduling. Who's working today? Who didn't show up today? Just managing all the pieces of the area. Showing them how to run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stop when they need to. <laughs> That's important. It is. That's important. <laughs> Very important. Yep. Yeah, I, I would certainly think it's important to build this. Yeah. 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 I think it's important and I think I'll make a motion to approve this. Second. Job description and the pay schedule as well. Correct. Yes. The pay range of 16 to $19 per hour. That's it. Yeah. Additional discussion. A motion by Shea and a second by Jorgensen to approve the job description for the chairlift operator team lead. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I, I should have asked a question. I'm sorry. Uh, two questions, I guess. Are, are these multiple people or is this just one person? This, this could be up to two to three people. Okay, case. that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So this could be two maybe three people and these are these are going to be part-time people possibly i mean if we found a full-time person that'd be great right. but it's it is very difficult right. i think we have found over the past couple of years <clears throat> to find a person that will work full-time during just a few months right. yes okay yeah okay. good question Now we're moving to Jana Limerick, Director of Human Resources, and Jeff Franco, Executive Director of Conservation. Discussion and or decision to approve pay ranges for the following positions at Mount Crescent. Kitchen manager, kitchen staff team lead, rental shop manager, rental shop team lead, snowmaking team lead, sports schools coordinator, and hospitality and guest services worker. Yes, as we did last year, um, we came to you last year and wanted to increase the pay a little bit, and we would like to do the same thing this year. And a big reason for that is because we have returning people, and we'd like to be able to have a little bit more of a range so that if, when we have returning employees, that we can start them higher. If they were already at the top last year, we'd like to at least give them a dollar something. So for if we go through them one by one, for kitchen manager, it was $18 to $20. We'd like that to be $18 to $25. What's the BA behind that? Well, that would be an excellent question for Heather. BA. Yeah, she's got a BA behind all of them that we're asking. Board approval. Board approval. That's what it stands for. Okay. Pending board approval. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Do you want me to go through them one by one? Do you want to approve them each one by one? How would you like to do this? Go through them all first. Are they, again, it's pretty much my same question. Mm -hmm. These are potentially part-time or not. And your kitchen manager, Jeff, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, all of these are seasonal positions. 
that have the potential for up to 40 hours. Up to, but I mean, you could have, I don't know what you call first shift, kill the kitchen manager, and then the guy comes in for night shift or whatever you, I don't know exactly the total operation, but is, is it, are they going to work more than eight? Is anybody work more than eight hours a day? Could be, absolutely, yes. Which is up to how many hours a day? Well, I I don't know that I would say there's a limit. Would you say, Jeff? Would there, there be, be a limit? So it, typically, I mean, it, there's a chance that somebody could work up to 12 to 15 hours a day on some of those days. Mm -hmm. You get a midnight madness, which will start 10 a.m. in the morning, and that will run until midnight on a Friday. Um, there's there's the potential for a significant number of hours there. It's not very often. Typically, those managers are in charge of assigning when people show up, and so they'll have team leads take different shifts throughout the day. Maybe they start, the kitchen manager comes in. You really try to reduce the number of hours, keeping those to eight a day if possible, just so it's easier on staff. They don't get burned out. So we're looking at time and a half then of additional hours. It could be if they there could be some overtime. Yes. Yeah. But they'll be on a weekly years. basis. Correct? Yes, overtime is 40 hours in a week. So if they go over 40 right. hours in a week, then they would get overtime right. so for that, anything after that. that. That's me. Yep. So how many weeks do they have to go at 40 hours before they become full time? Well, they don't. So this is a seasonal position. It's not a regular. So full time could be one thing, but then you have the definition of seasonal. That's the other. Yes. And then when we do our look back period for benefits, if during that look back period, you weren't working an average of 30 hours a week during that period, you don't qualify for benefits. And that period? the period I think is. October through May or something, but they they they've already stopped working by the time we've done that look back right, period. Six month period. But it does it doesn't matter because they've already been terminated. So usually these seasonal people are done working in April. We do our look back period in May. They're not active employees in May. So it it's and we have worked with the conservation department very closely on this to make sure that we are keeping our eye on that. But by the time that they're term they're terminated, they're no longer a uh, active employee. Does the state establish the look back period? No. The um, Affordable Care Act, when it started in what? 15? Maybe something. They established that look back period. So that's more of a federal thing, not a state thing. And you can do look back period a variety of different ways as long as you do it. Yeah. You could. I mean, some businesses do a look back period every single month, every 30 days. They run a report to look and see, did anybody hit full time hours? And then what do we need? Do we need to offer them something? What do we need to do? So that would come into play for our benefits, our health benefits. Overtime would be anything over 40 hours in a week, no matter what. Seasonal, temporary, no matter what. Even if you're part time, if you work over 40 hours in a week, we have to offer you overtime. Okay, I'm going to take my supervisor Jorgensen hat off. Mm -hmm. I put on my supervisor Whitman hat. On. <laughs> <laughs> How does this affect your budget? So it it would affect the budget this way, um, but at the same time, any time that we're utilizing these people, uh, we're going to be open. We're going to be generating revenue. Uh, at the same time, having a slightly a slight increase in pay is going to attract better candidates, especially the people that we'd like back. We're going to be providing better services, which is going to get more people to be coming back regularly as well. So uh, it's a little bit of an investment up front and it might hit the bottom line initially, but ideally you make that up with better customer service and better product. And and as as the facility changes to three seasons, four seasons, I mean these positions are going to expand. Yes, potential. Potential. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So if you would put um, the number against what you did last year, what are you talking? Thirty five hundred dollars, five thousand dollars. Probably in that range, somewhere in that range. By the time all of the hours are accumulated, most of these 
pay increases are a dollar. No, I saw, I saw some, somewhere in that range. I mean, yeah. it, it won't be a significant increase when you're talking about maybe $900,000 or more in revenue. Right. And most of them will not Correct. be overtime. Right. If you're worried about that, some some will be about most of the time. We'll they keep that to a minimum as best we can. That's something Absolutely. we manage very closely. Depends, depends on mother nature. We might want to open up seven days a week, twenty four seven. Twenty four seven. That's very good. Well, you create scenarios, Scott. If it's, a, if, it's, if it's a cash machine, you better make it while you can. Let's make it while the sun shines. Just like right. just like the heat, the heat came for about three days, and now we're cool. You get the snow, you got to use it while it's there. So is this all of the positions at Mount Crescent that you're considering for pay raises? We're not going to get another request in next week and then the following <laughs> week. This is one. We, we don't Good think, question, Susan. We don't think you'll get another request. We did, Heather and I sat down with the Mount Crescent team to review these so that we could get them to you one time. Our goal is to only bring this to you one time and then that will be it. What you could possibly see are status change forms with employees now moving within this range, but we don't think that we will need to sit in front of you and ask for different a uh, different pay range. Because right. so now that we have the positions with the pay ranges, now we'll be putting the people in there. And so what's age? Uh, we talking 16 to 20 year olds or what what are we? We're talking so, well, it depends for the increases yeah. we're talking about specifically here. Most of these are managers or team leads, right? Right, which will be uh, 18 plus typically, 18 plus, right? For okay. these total operations, 14 year olds, down to 14 sometimes. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're up to speed, but they're going to have to turn grass and school into a sports complex type thing. I didn't see that, so you'll have a lot of. 14 to 18 year olds probably going out there to do or if they're, whether it's baseball or golf or whatever they're going to practice. Right. So they may be in the neighborhood and want to have an opportunity to make some money too. Yep. While That'd they're be there. Great. That, that would, so I don't know how to do it. Technology too. Right. I don't know how you market. I'm not sure how you market to that. You know, how you find out the best way to market it. Somebody on your marketing team can probably figure that Put out. Put a big right. sign right up in front of the school. But, it's a, but, but that might be a, a good place to, if they're that, I guess, energetic to go out there and do that thing, they, they may want to make some money well along the way. And um, Heather um, and Kim and Angie do go out to the schools and take flyers, all the, the schools around as well. So they do a really good job reaching out to the schools to get... They're they're out there working on it now. I think it started up this fall. She thought it would. Oh yeah, I talked with uh, Dr. Morello. What are you doing? Yes, so about the Crescent School. Yeah, and they're going to do something with it this fall. Sports practicing technology, and it's kind of good to evolve. No, no, that's is good. What she that's said. Just looking for uh, golf and baseball and uh, robotics. Yeah. Well, is that going to still allow us to vote there this fall? I I would guess yes. Okay, I'm not worried about but that. I'm not but I'm not on yeah, their board, no. but I would think so. No, I did the school fill in it then? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they will. Okay. Yeah. All right, then they have a lot of sense. And she said it'd be an evolving thing. So, and I don't like it's it, not it, a very you don't like get hit by a baseball once in a while. I need to sign this. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so I'm not quite sure what the motion needs to read here. It's not clear to me. And we we've, we've got to a pay the ranges. request is to approve the pay ranges for the following positions that we've talked about to raise pay by up to blank per hour from last year. So I don't think that's quite what we were oh, looking no. for. Pay ranges. No. Pay no, they're not equal. So we don't we don't want to say up by a certain amount per hour. Last year, what we did is we just documented each one. Ranges. Yeah. So for example, in the minutes, it would say kitchen manager approved at eighteen dollars to twenty five dollars an hour. Kitchen staff team lead approved to 
$16 to $19 an hour. Do you have all those written down? Yeah, it was in the board's packet. Okay, but well, it's a you, matter of getting them in the minutes correctly. Could the motion be to raise them as provided? Described or as described, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jen, I'm not going to second guess you. I, I, I would be, I would be willing to approve. I'll, Thank you. I'll make a motion to Thank approve you. the pay ranges as described in our packet. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. okay. Well, I have to describe that. That's good. That, that's so we'll make it show sure it's more open. The ones re recommended for 24 25 in the yellow. Yeah. Yeah. I'll Correct. That. Correct. And in the minutes, Melvin, if you would like, because Jeanette has this packet, she could write out each one. Kitchen manager, right, 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 this right. amount. Yes. Yes. Yep. A second by Jordan said to approve the pay ranges as described on the spreadsheet in our packet during discussion. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Hey, cool. Jeff, there was one thing real quick. There was a $5,000 promotional expense on the pay accounts payables yesterday from EC Inc. for the ski hills. Do you know what that was about? That'd be Irvin and Smith. That'd be the rebranding process for the ski hills. For okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Updates from last That's week. It's a long thing. Long time for a quick deal. Um, trails I had a deal on conservation. I can't remember where it was. And then the roads operation center open house. I was out there. And then the airport open house. Then I did go to the VA car show. Say so we're real. That was good. How you how you show your car in that heat? I don't know. <laughs> I'd be inside in the air conditioning. And there was a lot of people in there. Okay. Jeff didn't no. have anything. Scott, do you have anything to report on? Cold no. weather. No. I, I was concerned with the car scenario. Cool weather. So. Cool weather. Cold no. will be in six more months. branches. More branches. More chainsaw. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Got to Two chains. Now. Did anyone sign up for public comments? If they did, they're not here in the room anymore. Oh, my God. All right. Motion. Signatures here on the second sheet. John, you going to uh, stop back and talk to Carlos and Mr. See what we can uh, put a bunch of marks on their paper. God, I sure. thought Matt would, uh, why I would do so. I think he had something he had to do real quick. Right. We need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. That 192nd, that's, that's a mess down here. All in favor? Aye. Aye.